Thank you everyone for allowing me to take a moment of your time. My name is Bree Burks and I am part of the site solutions team here at Viva. We are partnering with Black women in clinical research and my friend Danielle Mitchell in two ways. First, we're partnering to provide awesome career opportunities. Uh, look out for upcoming lunch and learns or visit careers.viva.com to learn more. And second, to make you aware of a free application available to sites. SiteVault helps CRCs and CRAs work better together by helping sites go paperless and provide a great remote monitoring experience. It's great for sites because it can be used across all studies and it's 100% free. There are no strings attached. And Viva provides validation and support from a dedicated team of former clinical research professionals. It's great for CRAs because it provides a seamless experience for remote monitoring with a single login across all sites. SiteVault is connecting more than 5,000 sites on the same platform used today by more than 400 industry sponsors. Tell your sites to learn more and to sign up at sites.viva.com. Hello, everyone. My name is Danielle Mitchell. I'm the CEO and founder of Black Women in Clinical Research. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Tonight, we are going to be talking about site ownership. And so I would like to introduce my co-host, Andrika Thomas. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrika Thomas. I am currently a project manager at Walgreens. So congratulations to me. I just started a month ago. Uh, I am also the creative director for Black Women in Clinical Research. So the marketing that you see going around, the flyers, the presentations are created by me. I am also the interview prep queen and salary negotiation goddess. So, so if you ever need any of those services, please reach out and we will get you together. Thank you. Congratulations, Andrika. I am really glad that you are embracing these titles that... Um... <laughs> A lot of hats to wear. <laughs> I need another hat at this point. <laughs> and so thank you so much, Andrika. And I'm going to have Latoya Hinton Harry introduce herself, please. Okay. Well, I'm Latoya Hinton Harry. I am the owner of Next Innovative Clinical Research. Um, we are located in Houston. Um, we'll be opening up a new site in Chicago um, mid June. Um, so I'll be able to tell you about all the. Um, um, experiences of site ownership, whether it be embedded in a doctor's office or a um, standalone research site. Thank you, Latoya. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Lovey. Hey, everybody. I'm Dr. Lovey, the owner of Randomize Now. I am the director of research and also one of the sub um, investigators for the company. And we are located um, headquartered out of Peachtree City, Georgia, which is about 40 minutes south of downtown Atlanta, if I get my directions correct. <laughs> um, and we are um, embedded in a few clinics throughout the area. So I'm happy to be here and let us know if y'all have any questions throughout the talk today. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lovey and Latoya. We are going to go ahead and get started. So... When it comes to clinical research, a lot of times, you know, finding what motivates you. So can you share with us what motivated you to become a clinical trial site owner and what experience do you have in the field? Um, well, I got started because I worked for a couple of small SMO site management organizations and I didn't like how it was being ran. I didn't like how the uh, coordinators were responsible for everything. And then the site owners really didn't have a lot of research experience. They were just, you know, CEOs from other companies, you know, heard it was a, you know, good thing to have a site. So they would hire people with <clears throat> research experience, but it was like so many responsibilities on coordinators. I'm like, this is just not the way it should go. So I'm like, I should start my own. So um, just starting my own research facility as a coordinator gave me a lot of insight on how everything should be done if, if a coordinator seems over overworked because they're seeing patients and doing regulatory. Well, how about them just focusing on seeing the patients and not doing regulatory? So, you know, just splitting up the responsibilities because I've been there. So I know exactly, you know, what's needed, you know, at the site level. Okay, that's very interesting. I know when I was at the site level, 
they had regulatory and, you know, the, the patient aspect, they were separate. So all I focus on, like you said, and I know, I know a lot of sites are not set up that way, but I feel like it really worked for our site. So we had a regulatory department and then we had um, the coordinators that were reviewing the patient, you know, documents and um, reviewing the patient binder. And then we also had the research nurses that were actually seeing the patient. So mm -hmm. they broke it up in three, you know, different ways for the clinical trial site. So even though it was broken up, I still had a lot of studies. A lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, Dr. Lovey. Yes, so how did I get started in clinical research? Um, so first off, that is the, the question, correct? You know me, I'll jump from question. <laughs> yep. what, what, motivate you, what motivated what you and what experience do you have? Yes, and I'm sorry, y'all. I'm so tired. It's been a long day, but I'm here and I'm happy to be here. Um, so um, what motivated me is that I started at Emory School of Medicine as a clinical research nurse. Um, I went back and got my double master's in doctoral um, and became a clinical research nurse practitioner. And I, in the midst of that, had a few, you know, um, promotions um, and was able to leverage a little bit of leadership there and became um, oversight and management for a team called the Asset Team, um, which was really neat because that team actually allowed me to kind of duplicate myself. I was one of the, I was the highest enroller. They tell me to take credit. So I was the highest enroller in that department um, for many, many years. Um, and so I went on maternity leave and the numbers just dropped. So when I came back, they're like, hey, we have this team called the Asset Team. Can you oversee the team? And essentially teach them how you do your recruitments um, and how you do your enrollments. And so from there, um, Obviously, I just kind of had my niche of um, educating at the bedside, creating advocates for research within the hospital. I did emergency medicine research, so it was very, um, very tedious if you've ever done um, medicine in, I'm sorry, research in the inpatient setting and then to add to a trauma one center. Um, so I kind of look at the research I do now as kind of more laid back and way more relaxing. Um, so yeah, that's what motivated me to start looking at it. I've been an entrepreneur at heart, and so I was going to entrepreneur something. I know what it was. But um, God showed me that this was the, you know, the passion and the experience that I was building. I need to kind of focus things around that. So that's what motivated me to be where I am today. Well, thank you for sharing, Dr. Lovey. And I know mm -hmm. that you just posted on LinkedIn that you are celebrating two years uh, with Randomized Now. So kudos and congrats to you for embarking on your entrepreneurship journey. I know being mm -hmm. an entrepreneur is not easy. Also, uh, Latoya as well. I know <laughs> that it's not easy, but I know that it's also rewarding. Yes, very. <laughs> and yeah, being your own boss and creating your own hours. So with that, I know a lot of times, you know, when you become a site owner, and I've, I've seen this before, where site owners are trying to find clinical trials to participate in. Mm -hmm. So what, how do you select those clinical trials and what type of criteria do you use to evaluate them? Well, for me, um, the, um, my PIs are family medicine doctors. So I speak with my doctor or my PI to see what she's interested in. Um, like one of my doctors is more interested in like weight loss. The other one is interested in like general care, like diabetes, high blood pressure. But we just so happen to get a lot of women's health trials because mm -hmm. I love fibroids and endometriosis. I can talk about it all day long. But those, um, I just usually speak with my doctor to see what their um, what their interests are. Yeah. And then we look at other things such as if the patient, is it um, oral medication? Is it an IV infusion? And things like that. And if we have the staff to do the IV infusion. So that plays a um, part in it as well. Thank you, Dr. Lovey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely echoing what Toya said. And then just to add um, a little additional point for me, I just opened up the, I opened up my business being very, very open-minded because the really cool thing about being a nurse practitioner is that we have had our hands kind of dipped into every therapeutic area, if that makes sense. Um, and so knowing that I can really support any therapeutic area, I was really kind of open to see what doctors wanted to collaborate on um, research. Um, and so it led me first into, um, into family medicine. So most of my first studies were family medicine trials. Um, and then somehow I fell into nephrology and <laughs> nephrology is our number one specialty. Um, and we still reign as number two in our um, clinical, in our research studies in nephrology. So we, um, so nephrology is my number one and I'm just open to any other physician, um, you know, that's open to embedding research into their sites. 
And then from there, we go and we look for those trials for them. So it's obviously easier once you have a PI um, and you can support them. Again, any nurse practitioners in the room, just remember you can be that support um, and can be that that voice of experience if you have a research naive um, PI. So. Okay, so sounds like having a principal investigator, a mm -hmm. very strong principal investigator is really needed, you know, when it's time to select a clinical trial. Yeah. So yes. let's see. So what is your process for recruiting and screening eligible diverse participants for clinical trials? Mm hmm. So for a majority of the trials that I've worked with, been extremely lucky because central um, central um, recruitment campaigns have been like a savior where um, the uh, sponsor will put out an ad, patients will put in their information, put in their zip code, and the patients will be um, funneled to our site. <clears throat> Another thing that we'll do is we'll reach out to local physicians um, that we network with and retrieve patients from them that way. And then, of course, um, Dr. Richmond is the social media queen. She's always posting on her TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, um, because she knows a lot of people in, um, in the Houston area. But for Chicago, what I decided to do was instead of, because I'll be a standalone site and I won't be I won't have a doctor's database to go off to, uh, but to, to go in. I decided to do um, community research. So I linked with a community organization where I can get the word out to the whole um, area of Bronzeville within Chicago. And then that'll trickle out to other people within other areas. But I just found that in Chicago, it was more important for me to do community, whether um, go through the doctor's database. Mm. Because really I don't have a doctor's database. I have a choice. <laughs> right, right. But no, that, that makes sense. Different um, zip codes for different, um, you know, different things with different zip codes. So that, that yeah. makes sense and definitely speaks to um, what I was going to say as well is with me, um, the, the doctor databases um, as far as for um, recruitment and then referrals, because now you have those physicians that reach out to their colleagues and they tell them how well the studies are going. And, you know, they're like, oh, it's a really easy process. It doesn't put more work on you. That's the number one thing is, is it put more work on my practice? And are you trying to steal my patients? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so, like a whole thing with it. So if you want to open up a site, be prepared for how you answer that. But um, anywho, so that's one. And then for us, I mean, we're about 50% community engagement. We have, we're probably, Randomized Now is probably about to do their sixth um, event, community event. And we tag on to some pretty big events and we, you know, get databases from those events and are able to reach out to those patients. We actually can screen for some of the studies at those events. And so my team is so intentional about that. So that's how we do it. Okay. So it sounds like being intentional. With, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, recruiting and looking for diverse participants is essential to mm -hmm. having diverse patient, a patient population for your clinical trial study. And I know recently also as well, Dr. Levy, you guys were able to do the CVS event. So mm -hmm. engaging in those type of community events where you can talk to the community about mm -hmm. clinical trials in a in a safe setting is, is really important as well. So I, I feel like it's important for the community to see people who look like them in mm -hmm. these spaces. So that's mm -hmm. that's key to, you know, recruiting diverse participants. So with the next question, you know, when it comes to clinical trials and ensuring the safety, how do you ensure the safety and well-being of participants during the clinical trials? Mm -hmm. So one thing about the safety, I, I like to speak to my patients very candidly because initially they're always fearful of participating in a clinical trial because it's a clinical trial. But I always let them know the difference in participating in the clinical trial and taking medication that their doctor is given to treat them for a particular ailment. So if a doctor gives them, you know, let's say um, lisinopril, write them a prescription, send them home, they take them lisinopril, they have a reaction, they go to the hospital, they're paying their copay, they have to be seen. But if they're on a study, and something happens, they're gonna immediately come to the office. We're tracking them the whole time that they're on this medication. So I always give them the reassurance that they're never alone. You know, giving them the reassurance that, you know, the doctor or the um, research staff will always be there to answer any questions or offer any assistance if they have any adverse events. And the other thing to make sure that we're um, ensuring safety, we have a 24 hour line where they can text at any time and it goes to myself and the coordinator. So if they have any questions, they can always reach us. And that's one thing that a lot of patients are like happy about because they feel safe because they know that they can reach us and they're not dialing a number and getting an operator or waiting for a call to be returned. Like we, if it's an emergency, we respond immediately. Okay, thank you. 
Dr. Lovey. That's really good, having that 24 hour access to the patients. The patients want to hear that, you know. Um, there's actually going to be some, I wish she was on here, Dr. Marsh. Are you here, Dr. Marsh? I'm Mitch Marsh, Mike, if you are. <laughs> but I would have loved for her to just give a quick snippet about um, how she's going to add to the safety um, of these research trials and will actually be a um, solutions company for us here in the future. Uh, but anyway, as far as, you know, to add on to Toya, like you say, you all see me, I, I do a lot of what Toya do because she's like my mentor. So, um, but to add, um, we have a two review process when it comes to the protocol and when it comes to the uh, medical records. Um, so regardless if the study, you know, requires medical records, I have just educated my team to pull records because we have access to most of um, the EMRs. That's the electronic medical record for participants. Um, and so we have the two, we have a primary coordinator and then we have a backup coordinator and they both review the medications. They don't have to be experts on medications. I just teach them how to, this, it says this is a um, kind med. Um, these are contraindicated meds. Understand the difference between those two. Um, and then let me know what you all see. And then they bring it over to the um, provider side, which is either myself as the sub I, um, the PI, of course, will always review. And then we have a physician um, collaborator. So we, he's a physician, but he um, works more like as a coordinator, but then he's a physician, if that makes sense. Dr. Dabeem, if you're here, definitely unmute your mic. I he's here. I don't see him. Um, but yeah, so that's what we do. And the last thing is for AEs, we have an internal process with the 24-hour calls. And then we make sure that the patients have like a little, like a, um, even if the sponsor does not provide it, we make like these little business cards and it'll have like emergency phone numbers to include our internal numbers and then also um, numbers to the sponsors and um, contacts that the sponsors may provide. So, Yeah, I, I think that's a really a big concern for uh, people that are in the community and are thinking about participating in the clinical trials. I remember recently, uh, Dr. Lovey and I were at the Black Health Matters uh, Summit and someone from the community came up to us and asked us, you know, what happens if I have a reaction to the medication? So, you know, being able to educate the community about, you know, their safety and their well-being is really important to gain that trust and so that they feel comfortable with participating in a clinical trial. So thank you, ladies, for sharing as well. So um, with, with all this different type of, and I've seen it a lot, you know, different types of training for clinical research and it's on LinkedIn and what do you need to, what type of certification do your clinical research staff members have and what kind of training and certification do you recommend? Well, of course, everyone has to have um, GCP training and then if they're shipping off um, specimen um, IATA training, but we do an extensive um, protocol training. So even after the sponsor does a, a training and allow us to have the um, the notes from the SIV, you know, we go over it again because sometimes you may have coordinators that start after we've already been initiated. So we have to go over the training um, again, but definitely GCP training is number one. You down with GCP? Mm -hmm. said, I say you down with GCP. Oh, <laughs> you know me. Y'all know she. <laughs> Y'all know she'll make a song out of anything. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so HSP, I would require that for everybody. It's not required, you know, for um, the industry, but I have come. And the reason I started requiring it because I came across some sponsors and CROs that require HSP if a person had under two years of clinical research experience. So now I just make it standard. We have a, you know, a welcome package and you have your onboarding um, HR packet for our company. And so it's just a part of it. So everybody has to have that. Um, then, of course, I ate a... Um, protocol, like everything that's already said. And I think any, as far as anything additional, um, you know, we have like some internal things that we um, like to kind of our own certifications and disclosures and stuff that we have within the company, but that's about it. Okay. So I am going to hand it over to Andrika. <laughs> Thank you, Danielle. And forgive me because I'm still, I'm in the weather. Uh, but in terms of the participant population, we do have an understanding that they all um, vary in terms of their educational background. So mm -hmm. how do you manage the informed consent process and sort of what measures do you um, take to ensure that participants <coughs> understand the risk mm -hmm. and the benefits of participation? So I always send the, I email the informed consent when they schedule the appointment and then I um, provide the consent once they come into the office, allow them time to read it. But what I do is I like to quiz them to make sure that they did read it. Say, like, okay, so you understand that this is a 12-week a study and that we're taking your arm off, like whatever it may be. But I just want to, I'll say something off the wall to make sure that they're paying attention to me. And then we'll go and I make sure that they don't have any questions. But one thing I always um 
urge them to do, I give sticky notes so, or um, have them flag the pages so that we can just go over each individual thing that they may want to um, reinforce or they have questions about. But yeah, I always quiz them to make sure they understand the important parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely important. Those important, make sure they're reading them. Um, we have an association process that we just, it's not anything as the station process um, that we have. It's what it's a, um, one pager. Um, and if anybody has a site and wants me to share, I'm totally fine with sharing it. Um, but it just records. So the person that completes the consent, the coordinator, physician, whoever was in the room when that patient was being consented from when it was first mailed to them or emailed to them. So when they came in and signed and we looked at it to make sure it was done, their, their names will appear on that one pager. Um, and it has the exact date and time that's signed by the provider, coordinator and the um, participant on that one piece of paper. And so that's just kind of our internal process that we do, um, that we have um, in force. And I, my um, project manager, she is um, an advocate for just documentation, documentation. So it's, you know, we scan it in electronically with the consent and we also, um, you know, keep it. So that's just something just as an additive to the normal process of the form, informed consent. Nice. Shout out to the project managers out there. Never. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in terms of data, you know, data is gold for clinical research in most companies as well. So what type of data management and quality control processes do you have in place to ensure accuracy and integrity of clinical trials data? Mm -hmm. So back in the day, when we were <laughs> using paper, it was literally, I have to go through each individual one. And because I was like, kind of like the sole person and it just being another coordinator, literally going through the pages to make sure that everything was captured, making sure that it's correct. You make sure it's accurate. But now we've been using um, real time, which has saved my life. Because like I told you, my site is in um, Texas. I'm in, uh, I'm in Chicago. So I, I'm able now able to see what the coordinator does the same day. I'm able to click a tab and do QC to see if there's any pages missing or any data that wasn't collected. So that has been like a lifesaver. Um, and I would recommend any site owner to get a CTMS. It'll save you a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yep, definitely, definitely. Yep, I came from the dinosaur ages at Emory. When everything was on paper, just binders this big. They still send binders, but now you don't really have to, you know, fill them in. Just have a protocol and stuff. Like shell. And if you're still a paper site, because there are paper sites still out there, then you have that. But for me, I'm like, oh, what? Um, and so um, as a site, when I opened my site, I didn't have a bunch of money to open my site, which we, if you join other um, talks that we've had, you've heard how me and Toya started up. So just kind of piggyback off of that. I didn't have the money for like the real times and the Creos. So I utilized Vivo Vault, which was really nice, which is a free um, platform for you. So jot that down if you're a site owner or aspiring one. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's free, right? So I'm just putting that out here. It'll get you through until you can get some revenue. <laughs> <laughs> After that, you'll start to quickly introduce yourself to other ideas it, over it um i'm just gonna throw half the you know shout out nrc Nora research collective um and we also <laughs> um to help people to um you know get platforms and vendors and site solutions um that are more affordable because we have some connections and we have some um specialty packages that have been created just for um our our site so uh we actually have somebody in the room his name is angel and hey, angel. Angel, there he <laughs> he Angel looked out. So Angel was the first clinically take a look at it when you get a chance. But Angel was the first company for randomized now that we could afford when it came to um e reg um and ISF, electronic ISFs. Um and so that's what we utilize. Um they are developing their, you know, their platform. Maybe one day Daniel will have him speak, but um, they're developing their platform. So the things that they don't have right now um, until they become a full T CTMS, I utilize Creo, uh, which is way more expensive, very similar to real time. Um, but again, it kind of fills in some of those gaps. So Nice. We use Vivable as well. So very familiar. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so in terms of um, sort of um, regulatory requirements and keeping up to date with that, how do you ensure that your site is compliant? Mm -hmm. I do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, maybe then told you I have a really elaborate ass. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, for right now, that's the only way that I could 
make, you know, make sure that we're up to date with everything, that the protocols are up to date, the um, informed consents. Once we get something in, I make sure I distribute it to the sites and say, hey, this is what we're now using, or this is the amendment to the protocol. So right now it's just been me doing that, which is perfectly fine because it's just regulatory. I'd rather do just regulatory than see patients all the time, you know, because that would be you no know, fun to be in a site owner and have to see patients all the time. But um, doing the regulatory until I can train someone, that's the way I make sure that we're up to date is I make sure that everything that passes through me gets signed by um, Dr. Richmond in a um, good time and then, um, you know, allocated to the um, to the site. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, for me, my um, I have the assistance of my amazing project manager. Now we're going to change her title to regulatory specialist. <laughs> Her name is Khadidra Lyman. Y'all see, I shot her. Uh, huh? I said multiple hats. That's Listen, what we do. Most, and, so, and that's another thing. You're not to deviate from the conversation, but if you're a site owner right now or you're an aspiring one, it's your team. You cannot, and Toya will tell you, your team is what will make your site successful. You cannot do this by yourself. You God gave you the gift to entrepreneurship, that business. That's it. <laughs> you're supposed to find somebody that has the expertise in every other area. I wasn't an expert at half of this stuff at Emory, and I wasn't trying to make myself an expert, as, a, as a, but I'm a businesswoman. So I knew how to find people that understood what it is to be a team player. Everybody can be the chief. I'm the number one chief. And then after that, we all work together. We're a team. I don't say staff. We, I don't have staff. We teammates because we all really are on the same playing field. But at the end of the day, I call the shots. That's the final decision. But other than that, I trust my project manager. Um, I want to make her assistant director one day. Is she on here? Maybe that'll be a surprise. I don't see her on here. Um, <laughs> that's how we... Um, that's how I, I have helped my regulatory is Khadidra. Nice. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry, because we might need therapy after this next question. <laughs> so what are some challenges that you have faced in running clinical trials so far and how have you overcome them? I think the number one challenge for me is being in a completely different city. Mm -hmm. So because I can't go to the site every day or see the patients every day, I would go to Houston like maybe once or twice a month. But having trustworthy staff and dependable staff would be the number one um, challenge. Um, because I'm not there, I have to trust that the work is being done correctly. And again, before I was using paper charts, so I have to wait till I get to Houston to go through everything. Now I can go through um, real time to do it, but now I have the most amazing coordinator there that's doing everything. She's on top of everything, which is really, really great. Um, I think that on, um, moving forward to the Chicago office, I don't think it will be as challenging only because I'm here and I'm able to train. But I definitely think that even if I'm able to train someone, being able to keep up with um, the demands of the economy and people wanting to get paid more. And, you know, that's I don't want to say that's why I like using inexperienced people because I have them a little while longer, even though I have to hold their hand a little bit more. But even after I train them, train a medical assistant, I'm able to hold on to them a little bit more versus having an experienced coordinator. And then, you know, some CRO or sponsor get a hold to them and it's like, I can't compete with that. Mm -hmm. Very true. How about you, Dr. Lovely? Yeah, that's my biggest fear. Like I, the, um, I think some of them have told me already when they added, you know, their research experience on their LinkedIn, that's one of the things I don't, I don't require it to be a part of the team, but I say, it'd be nice if you'll get on LinkedIn. And then of course people start getting their inboxes. Hey, we're paying a $20,000 sign on bonus. So whatever, you know, something sparky and I'm like, Lord, but the one thing about me, I'm all about leverage. I'm all about, you know, living your dreams. And I tell them, just be honest with me. You know, if you look for another job, let me fill out your, let me fill out your recommendation. Like I was, you know, because at the end of the day, I know that they all are going to have to grow at some point. Now, do I pray that my core team is of these four women? Do I pray they just never leave me? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but how I balance that is, and again, it's, it's, it's still piggybacking off of the challenges is that I make sure we look for uh, work-life balance. So our project manager is on the phone today. I mean, our operations manager is on the call today. Her name is Jay Anderson. Um, and she makes sure she's come. She's not a research person, but she's a business person. And so she's come in and looked at some of our systems and say, okay, 
work-life balance, we need more of that. So like now on Fridays, we actually have our staff meeting at a restaurant. And um, nice. yeah, it's really cool. And so they get the clock in an hour of that time, which is just the meeting time, but we can just hang around all day if we just want to sit around and have food and, you know, all that stuff. So everybody looks forward to Friday. Tomorrow we're going, I don't know where we go. They just send me the link and I show up. But um, so that's one thing. And then another challenge is... Um, I take everything to heart. I'm sensitive. So if anything go wrong, I blame it on myself. It's been time me and the coordinators have, you know, made mistakes and we've made some costly mistakes and we've made some embarrassing mistakes in the midst of this. We're on study like number 11 now since I've had the company. So uh, we've made some mistakes and more, st more mistakes will come. And I've just beat myself up so bad behind those mistakes that at one point I just was about to quit. You know, I was like, I just, I can't do it. But had I done that, I would have not been where I am today. And one of my good friends, a sheep was on the phone and she gets to hear all of my crying moments so thank you so much for joining she too is a site owner and me, me and her actually opened our sites at the same time and have nice. grown together so love nice. you girl, <laughs> hey, girl love you <laughs> we gotta interview interview you too <laughs> yeah, get her on here. yep thank you okay so um in terms of patient engagement what is your approach there and how do you involve um participants in your clinical trial process but, you know, I keep them up to date if there's any um, changes or anything new. I remember one time um, in the middle of a study, the drug was approved by the FDA for another indication. So always sharing with them, you know, the happenings of the drug and, you know, what's going on and let them know that they're, you know, advancing science and things like that, but also to keep them engaged. Again, we have text messages. So one thing I always do when I'm consenting my patients, if I when I'm there, um, I, I talk to them and just get some insight about who they are. You know, it might be something that we have in common, you mm -hmm. know, and so I'll just play off that. Or if they have something and they talk about their mother's 70th birthday party that they're planning, you know, I may follow up with a text message and ask, how was your mom's party? Mm -hmm. So I'll do some things to make it a little personal, because one thing I love about when and I want to say I'm not a coordinator, but being a coordinator and owning a site is making your patients feel like they are not necessarily um, a part of the team, but you actually care. Yeah. Um, and I, when they when patients think about dropping from the study, I don't want them to think I'm going to drop from this study because I don't care. I want to be a part of. I want them to be like, man, I don't want to let Toya down. So, <laughs> yeah, let me just call it because I always tell them, just let me know how you feel. And if you feel a way about participating in the study, let me know. It may be something we can work around. But I always want to let them know that, you know, that they're a person. They're not just subject number 130451. Yeah. Like, so they're yeah. more than just a subject. So I try to get them involved in like more, a little bit more personal things about them and just stay engaged that way. Mm hmm. That's really good, that follow-up. And um, obviously, I'm a talker, so I'm a people's person. That's, that's my strength as a nurse. That's what, what I was known for at the bedside. Was I got too close to my ICU families, and I cried with all of them when someone died. So I, it's no different now. <laughs> but again, it helps with that engagement. Um, and so to add to that, maybe... Um, you know what? Maybe that's, maybe that's a, some room for um, improvement. Hey, maybe we should make a note of that. Maybe that's, I don't really have an answer how I can add to that because I, I think that's something that we can do better at um, is keeping patients engaged because I feel like right now we're such in like go mode, go mode, go mode. Um, and, you know, so we should be a little bit more connecting in between and say, hey, I know your appointment's not, for, you know, until four weeks from now, but we're just calling to check in. So actually, yeah. thank you for that, Toy. I'm actually going to add that on to new things so, that we can To add on to something else, um, mm -hmm. real time, and I know Creole, also um, has the same thing. They have a patient engagement option where in between the patient's visits, they'll send a text message just to remind them, hey, don't forget to log into your diaries or okay. it may say different things. You can set it to say what you want it to say, uh -huh. but it could, you can literally set it. If the patients are coming in every um, four weeks, you can set it for every two weeks to send them a message nice. in between. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Convenient. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that information. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being transparent, uh, Dr. Levy. Mm -hmm. Okay, Danielle, back over to you. Back to me. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. If you have any questions, now is the time to drop it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask. Thank you. And I was gonna say this too, while you guys were talking, I was thinking about this. I was trying to pull up her information, but uh, one of the patients, when I went to the SCRS conference, the summit, I should say, she mentioned that she wanted to receive a thank you card. 
You know, she said that she participated in the clinical trial and she said she never received a thank you card. So I, I found that very interesting because, you know, having that human aspect, I feel like it's really important. And then also she said, I want to receive a, a birthday card. She was like, you know, I want to feel special on my birthday. And, you know, she said that it's important to tell patients thank you and to give them birthday cards. And so I posted it on LinkedIn and I found that a lot of people said that they do that at their sites. So that was just really interesting to me because I had never, you know, we don't always really hear from the patient perspective, some of their concerns that they have. So just hearing that from her, I was like, let me post this on LinkedIn and see, you know, if other people are doing this, but, you know, I, I think it's really important, like we were saying, to include the patients because they they have a voice too. And they, they want to, you know, they have questions. She also mentioned about clinicaltrials.gov. She was saying that clinicaltrials.gov is not where she wants to get her information from. So I just, I just found that very interesting that quite a few patient advocates that I talked to have said, I'm patient, uh, clinicaltrials.gov is not my first, that's not where I want to go for information. And, and I'm realizing that you know, patients want information as far as participating in cl clinical trials that is more patient friendly. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of things you, know, you don't really realize if you're not talking to the patients and really, you know, understanding where they're coming from. So I, I felt like that was very good, you know, attending the SCRS conference and hearing the patient's perspective. So let's see if anyone has any questions. You know what, what we'll do? This is what I'm going to do. Angel, I, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but we brought your name up a couple of times. So Angel, mm -hmm. if you want to come in and introduce yourself as well, and I'm probably going to do it with you as well, Ashika. If you don't mind, if you're available, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but y'all here. So we family. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, Danielle. And, and a pleasure to virtually meet most of you. Though some of you have met in person or, or met at conferences. Right. Uh, so I'm, my name is Angel Pettit. I'm the executive vice president for business operations for Clinically. Um, and, you know, I've tried my best, right, to kind of support kind of the mission, right, that Black Women in Clinical Research is trying to push out there just because, you know, I think like on a personal level, like as a person of color, who's also an executive at, tech, at a technology company, you don't tend to see that as much, right, in this industry. Um, and so I just, I feel a small responsibility, right, to kind of help out where I can, right, which is what Dr. Lovey was mentioning, right, that I've been trying to engage with, you know, this community in general to see like what it is that we can do to help. And right? I think a lot of people um, in this industry tend to talk about what they want to do to help promote diversity, but then don't actually do much about it, right? Um, and I've been trying my best to find ways, right, that we, you know, we're a small company, we're fairly new in the market, um, and that's kind of what our role is, so. And I don't know if you don't want me to ruin our surprise for now and still save it for the end, then I will, um, mm -hmm. but that's who I am. We'll save it because that makes people stay. There you go. That's fine. <laughs> so, yes, let's save our surprise so they can find out what it right. is towards the end. Yeah. And then the last thing I'll just add is I did put my email address in there. I didn't come here today to try to sell anybody anything. That's not really why I wanted to participate. Um, my email address, I threw it in the chat, or um, it's pretty simple. It's Angel Eye Clinically. If you want to reach out to me and ask some just general questions, I'm happy to answer anything I can. Okay. Thank you, Angel. Quick question, Danielle. Can um, people raise their hand if they're already site owners and already have? Yes, like I was gonna. You read my mind. I was gonna say that. I was like, I was like, we should probably have people. If you're a site owner, raise your hand. Or if you're interested, you know, have it where people raise their hands and then turn around and say, well, if you're interested in starting your own site, mm -hmm. raise your hand as too. So yes, that's why we're business partners, Latoya and uh, Dr. Lovey. So yes, if you are a site owner, could you please raise your hand so we just know, you know, who is all in the room. scrolling through to see okay so we have two site owners Anna and oh okay Anna and Sheka well two site owners in addition to our speakers no uh oh I thought somebody else had their hand raised okay all right so if you are interested in owning your own site or starting your own site please raise your hand Hands are going up. I feel like if 
if they could raise two, they would. <laughs> What's the song? Hands up and we uh -huh. stay there. <laughs> up, down, up, down. Yes. Wow. That's pretty amazing, everyone. And the people that don't have their hands raised, they're probably like, listen, uh -uh, y'all do, y'all got too much going on. Especially like CRAs has been doing this for a really long time. And they, because I've, I've never been a CRA, but I've, I've worked with so many now. And they're like, girl, you can have this. It. Like, <laughs> they come and I, sometimes we get personal and I'm like, yeah, it's all right. It's, it's so much. But And I, I know so many CRAs that contact me because they're uh, interested in opening a site. Oh, wow. Yep. Yeah. Good to partner with, too, because they have so much information. Yeah, I had someone tell me that um they told me they'll give me five years and I'll have my own site. So I don't know. Yeah, you that, then you have a site tomorrow. You would have to be the easiest person to start a site up with. I must say Detroit is, I mean, I know Detroit is popping up. Um, you know, DM Clinical, I believe, is has a site that's opening up here, or they already have one here in Michigan, but there really is you know an opportunity if I if I did want to go that route for Michigan, because Michigan is doesn't really have a lot of site owners. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into these questions. And if you wanna come, while I'm going through these questions, if you have a question, you wanna come off of mute, please feel free. I'm just gonna try and scroll up to the questions. Well, but if, if you want me to go to the first one. Okay, okay, well that'll work. I'll let you okay. do that and I'll I'll do the, the raise hands. Um, Cause I don't know if these hands are raised because people still wanna be site owners or if, they're raised because they have a question. We can. I think it's still the site owners. Okay. Uh, so the first question in the chat comes from LaDonna Graham. She wanted to know, how did you recruit the physician to work with your site? So my friend actually introduced me to Dr. Richmond. Um, like I said, I'm in Chicago. She's in Houston. And she expressed a little bit of interest. She really didn't know what it was about. I had created a, um, a little one pager to um, let the physicians know what they could gain by participating in trials and with some expectations of the doctor. And I flew down to Houston and met with her and she was interested. Um, my second, um, my other sub eyes that I get were just introduced to me from the PI. All you really need is one doctor because doctors have doctor friends. And once you get engaged with one, they'll introduce you to, to more. Um, and also my the PI I have for Chicago, I was um, went to grade school with her. So I just reached out to her. So if you are looking to get a doctor, what I would suggest you do is just reach out to the doctors that you already know. Reach out to your family medicine doctor, your kid's pediatrician, or, or whatever um, area you're interested in. Reach out to the doctors that you already know. And then also, I don't know if they have it in every area, but in Chicago, they have a um, website called ZogDoc. Dot com, And mm -hmm. you can look on there and look up different specialties and look because majority of those doctors are private practice. And that's the other thing you need a private practice position. So those doctors are within private practice. You can look them up, schedule an appointment or just call to schedule a meeting and just speak with the doctor. I, that's what I always um, done. I just call them up and can I get an appointment with you? This is what I'm offering. So it's Same worked thing. so far. Same thing here. Nice. I have a friend in med school and I'm already whispering in his, in his ear, clinical trials <laughs> from now, you know, just so that he's aware and, and maybe can learn more about it, see if that's something he wants to do. Mm -hmm. uh, another question, sorry, there are two hands raised. So let me know if those are actual questions. Uh, LaDonna, do you have a, another question? Oh, she took her hand down. How about you, Shauna or Shana? Shanna, something. Okay, no. Okay. All right. So another question from the chat from Yvette White, um, and you kind of answered this before, um, Latoya, is she wants to know if you would hire someone with no clinical research experience, but they have transferable skills. Oh, the transferable skills I look for right now are, are medical assistants, um, because medical assistants have um, clinical skills and then also they know how to draw blood because that's the one thing I desperately need when I have someone come in that's um, that's um, starting with no experience. Um, for everything else, transferable skills may be someone who could do recruiting, you know, calling on the phone, customer service skills. So, you know, I'm definitely open to um, anyone who's willing to learn. Nice. Thank you. Um, next question is from Andrea Lamette. She said, what are the startup costs for opening a site and what licenses do you need to obtain? You want the real truth? 
<laughs> oh no. <laughs> because in all honesty, when I started, all I had was my laptop and zero dollars. Um, because I was embedded, my first site, I'm embedded into a doctor's office. I didn't need anything to start up because the office already has a scale. Um, they may have EKG. They have the basic things that you need. So you won't have to purchase anything extra. You may have to purchase a, a refrigerator or a freezer um, to, to store drug, depending on the study. But the most I had to buy was a lock and some shelving units. That was it. And one thing I always tell people who are um, into starting a site, don't go out and get a lease on a space and you don't have a doctor and you don't have a trial because you'll be paying money and you don't have anything coming in. And okay. the other thing is I wouldn't advise buying anything until you get your first study, not necessarily until you get your first study, till a sponsor call you and say, we coming out next week. That's when you go buy stuff because there's no need in buying things that, you know, that's just sitting around you. You spent money that you could have utilized on something else. But yeah, when they call and say, we coming out, you know, I have a checklist of uh, some basic things that's needed. But yeah, I wouldn't buy anything until they own their way. Nice. That's I good information. That. <clears throat> yeah, definitely echo that. Okay. <laughs> Um, the next question, going back to investigators. So do, do you have a contract with the um, PIs? Mm -hmm. As far as um, randomized now, um, yes, it's like individual contracts. It may sound kind of weird, but it's individual contracts per study. Um, and then once we're embedded, like we are in two clinics right now, hopefully our third one coming up, um, <clears throat> it's more of a business collaboration partnership because now I'm utilizing your space and we have an IP room there and we're literally sharing your building. So then it gets a little bit more, you know, technical on the legality knowledge, I guess, or whatever. You had lawyers write that stuff up. Uh, but other than that, it's just a, pretty much a straightforward, you send me these patients um, as the PI, this is your reimbursement, so. Nice, okay. Um, next question from Andrea as well. Is it feasible to start a mobile clinical site that goes to patients' homes? You're talking my language. <laughs> CT. Yeah. Well, I would say yeah. I would do it initially yeah. um, because if you're not established some site <clears throat> um, some sponsor would be like you're doing what how experienced are you but if you already have a site and then you want to move on and have a mobile unit that would be like amazing Mm -hmm. One of my first studies was actually a decentralized trial and it was um, a home in home trial. Um, and so for me, I felt comfortable doing it, doing it just because I'm <clears throat> sorry, I felt comfortable doing it because I did home health as a nurse for years. Um, so that was just personal for me that I felt comfortable and I felt comfortable training my staff on how to do it. And I have so I do have a mobile research team with mobile phlebotomists, mobile um, coordinators, um, and, and I have a mobile PI. I have a PI that um, does not have a practice, and she's an entrepreneur, and she travels with us now. So um, mobile is my language. That's where we're moving. If you can get a mobile practice up and going, that's going to be still compliant, and it's hard to be compliant, um, and you can be compliant, then you, you'll definitely be ahead of the game. And some of the things that you'll start to see um, moving to the industry. Thank you. Uh, Vita, you have several questions here. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and ask, or have some of them been answered already? Hi, yes. Some of them have been answered. I've actually been in clinical research and worked pretty much every area. Um, oh gosh, now probably for 30 years or better. So I'm just at that point now where I'm trying to wind down as a project manager, um, and actually start my own site to prepare myself for retirement in the next couple of years, um, but just have a um, genuine desire to impact and reach um, people of color, um, to educate them, to advocate for them, and then to express to them how important clinical trials are. So um, I've actually had an opportunity to kind of drop in my lap where I have a physician who's willing to, hey, you can have my my patients, I've been here 24 years, I'm ready to retire, I'll be your PI, you can use my space. And so it kind of just dropped in my lap like very suddenly in the last uh, month. And so, uh, you know, been thinking about it for a while, just trying to get stuff together. So my questions were just as they pose, you know, um, know nothing about the financial startup, very much familiar with 
um, you know, pipeline studies that are in the pipelines, but how you access it if you're on the outside looking in, that type of thing. So um, any general information that can be provided would be fine. I'm just here um, listening and learning and um, want to take advantage of an opportunity that has been given to me. So, Is this awesome. the part where we plug Noir? Like, yes, I was about to say, I was about to say, <laughs> let Noir, I'm like, let Noir guide you <laughs> into <laughs> your journey that you are about to embark on. That's what I was about to say. Yes, go ahead. We definitely, <laughs> and we dropped the um, email to the admin executive assistant. Um, her name is Jay Anderson. <laughs> yeah, I did see that. Thank you. <laughs> right. And I so, saw that. Yeah, so you can email us and she'll get you. Do y'all have any questions as far as like, you know, questions about, and because, and I'm just saying this to be transparent, me and Toya's schedules are so, so packed. And so it'll come off like we never can get on a call uh, because people will email us, but it's not that. It's just that we, um, Jade will help us to get, she sees our calendars and she's able to get y'all on the calendar and we will actually show up to the meeting. I had a meeting today I missed because I scheduled it myself and should not did it. So um, <laughs> if you have like questions about the site, hit Jade up, she'll get y'all on the schedule and you'll get way more knowledge having me and Toya's insight on the call together. But we don't mind, you know, talking separately. It's just, we don't want to say no. <laughs> understood, understood. Yeah, yeah. I've been in it for a while, so I do understand. understand yeah. yeah, I do understand. Thank you though, thank you. Yeah, I don't schedule my own appointments because y'all will never see me if I... Never, ever. Because <laughs> I'm like, if, they, if Danielle can get on, um, her schedule is colorful. She has a rainbow on that calendar. I'm like, my God. Yeah, I'll drop my link for you in a minute. Right. <laughs> All right. Back to the questions, lady. There's quite a few more. So what made you go to the site route instead of remaining as an SMO? Well, for me, it's my initial um thought was to be an SMO, to have sites all over the place. And then um I don't want to say I just liked where I was and wanting, I just changed my route of thinking because in Chicago, um, and I see someone asking about um, saturated market, I'll, I'll answer mm -hmm. that question as well the same way. So I Googled and saw that there weren't a ton of sites in Chicago. You have like the university settings, University of Chicago, Northwestern, Rush, and they're conducting research. But of course, we all know that research is different at the site level than at the um university setting. So I decided that I wanted to focus on having a large research center or facility within um, different communities of Chicago versus having a SMO and other doctors run it. I just want everything to be centralized and kind of like under me. And you have more control when it's your site and it's your stuff versus the SMO when you're conducting things in different doctor's offices and you still have to abide by their rules, their laws. This is their office. But I wanted more control over what I was doing. And then the other thing is there's not a lot of sites in Chicago only because here there's a, a market thing called um, um, everything is owned by like Dooley or Advocate. So a lot of doctors don't have private practice. So some areas it may be difficult to, um, to be an SMO or to have other sites because those physicians don't own their practice. They're linked to a network where they can't conduct research in their office or they can and those networks are taking majority of the money. So it's like, it's really sticky when it gets to that. So that's why I decided to just do site ownership because it's mine and I can do what I want to do. And I think it's important to understand physicians, 99% of them aren't entrepreneurs. They're staff, they're employees. You know, we look at them sometimes, oh, you're a doctor. You should be able to do whatever you want to do. No, not if you work for a company, you're an employee, employee just how the nurse is an employee. Um, so that's very important to remember because I've had, you know, some sites, you know, say they've reached out to these doctors. They're like, well, they should be able to do it because I'm like, no, they work for that company. They cut them a check every two weeks, you know, so that's just important. You know, um, saturated. Oh, you want to speak to the saturated markets? I know Florida. If you want to like know a specific um area, the Miami Dade County area is very saturated. It's no secret to that. Um, so just if you're going to invest money into a site, you know, be very um kind of strategic on how you look at that. Um, so yeah, I know the time. Um, if yes. you know, somebody asked about phase. Trials, we do phase two and three. Is that the same thing with you, Toya? Two and three for the most part? Yeah, two and three, but eventually I'll be doing phase one. So that's the other thing about site ownership. When you have your own site, you have your own location, you can set it up how you want to. Mm -hmm. And the bottom floor of my next building that I will be purchasing will be um, set up so that I can do phase one studies. Oh, that's super dope. 
that's dope. That's dope. And I think somebody had asked. I'm just trying to make sure right question got answered. I was going to say, it's it's okay if it, you know, I know we have a lot of questions, but I just want to yeah, be conscious of time because we, we are at time. And yeah. I wanted to make sure that we uh, introduce our surprise as well. So thank you, Is it Latoya, okay? Dr. Lovey, for answering these questions. <laughs> Feel free. What's what's wrong? I, say? I said, is it Beyonce? You said it's a surprise. That's only yes. surprise. I want. <laughs> right. So if I could get Beyonce, I, I'd be in a different industry and business. And then I'm just looking. I'm like, everyone really stays. So that worked. We need to do this like every every, every time we have a meeting. Um, so I will let Angel tell us the surprise. My microphone died on me right when I was about to announce that. That was anticlimactic. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so the surprise is, I mean, Latoya made me feel like I need to live up to Beyonce now. So now I feel really bad. But um, so, you know, I appreciate again, like this is a community and you guys are getting together to kind of speak and share and um, try to grow. So I almost felt like this is something that would, if you could meet in person, right, at, over coffee, like that's something that would be great, right? You'd sit in a Starbucks and have this nice big meeting. So what I'd like, if you don't mind, right, is if you send me your email address, uh, Clinically is going to send you a $10 Starbucks gift card as if you guys were all getting together to meet over coffee, right? Because wow. I think the support in which you guys continue to meet and continue to kind of drive forward both, you know, entrepreneurship and diversity and employability, right? Like there's so many aspects to um, what you guys are doing as an organization that, again, as a you know, person of color who's in an executive role at a technology company, I, I know, you know, I wish I could send everybody a hundred dollar gift card. We're not that big yet, but we will be. Um, but for now it's gonna be, you know, I just want to be able to send everybody a quick um little ten dollar gift card. So I'm gonna again put it in the chat just so it shows up here, my email address. You send that to me directly, you're gonna see it's gonna come right from us. And it, you know, our way of saying, well, thank you for supporting Danielle's mission your own kind of growth within the industry as well um and you know i just wanted to do what i could to do that well thank you angel we really thank appreciate you. it i'm about to say the the perks of having good partnerships and creating good relationships with companies it it definitely means a lot to us that you um want to send us starbucks so i mean i love those cake pops there um <laughs> probably a little bit too much <laughs> at starbucks but um, thank you, everyone. And I'm going to I'm a, I'm a, uh, do some little plugs in here as well. So the Black Women in Clinical Research Conference is coming up. Make sure also you email Angel. Leave your LinkedIn URL in the chat. So that way, if anyone that is here today that you want to connect with, you can connect with on LinkedIn. I know a lot of times our name on here is different from our LinkedIn name. So sometimes after the meeting, we're trying to find you and we can't. So um, if you are interested in attending the Black Women in Clinical Research first conference, please um, go to our website and I'll put that here in the chat as well and register to attend. It's gonna be on October 20th through the 22nd. We're gonna do a conference like no other conference that you have ever attended before. We have companies that have said that they are willing to interview and hire on the spot. When have you ever been to a conference that's interviewing and hiring on the spot? And we're also gonna have a gala where we're gonna dress up Put on your uh, Sunday's best, uh, put on some makeup, your dancing shoes, all of that. It's just, we're going to have a good time and network. Um, we have Dr. Jane Morgan, Dr. Taria Richmond, Andrika. We have a lot of different speakers that I'm pulling together and that can confirm with um, soon. But I'm just excited for us to be together in the same room and to network and for a lot of us to meet each other because it's it's been since 2019 since starting Black Women in Clinical Research. And I know a lot of us have connected, but a lot of us have not met each other in person. So also we have apparel on the website. It is a conversation starter. If you don't know how to have that conversation with people within the community, I promise you, if you wear your Black Women in Clinical Research shirt, you will have conversations in probably the weirdest places. Um, <laughs> uh, if I say in the nail salon, the beauty salon, the grocery store, wherever you are, if people do see if you're representing a Black woman in clinical research, they will ask you about it. It's happened to me multiple times. So let me put this in the chat. Anything else uh, you ladies would like to say? Dr. Lovey, Latoya, Andrika? Y'all mm -hmm. have to, just how you all, how we, how we as a community go to ACRP, we go to SCRS, we plan for these things. People are already planning for next year to go to these things. I'm planning to go to SCRS 
um, next year, you know, so please, y'all, we have to be in attendance to um, the BWICR conference. This is going to be major. You want to be a part of the inaugural um, experience. I'm so super dope. My entire team will be there. I don't know how I'm paying for it right now, but they're going to be there. <laughs> <Gotta work. laughs> um, so I'm so super excited. So we'll get to see y'all um, there at the conference. Yep. And do not ask me for a discount. I'm not giving you one. No. Nope. <laughs> you don't even give them to us. <laughs> what do you say, lovey? I say you don't even give them to us, and you shouldn't. That, that's how it's supposed to be. We have to support our businesses, and so that's what we do. And also the app, Danielle. Everybody gets the app. Yeah. Yes, the app, too. And so, Latoya, while I'm pulling up the app, do you have anything that you would like to say? Um. Yeah. Um. So, add me on LinkedIn, Latoya Hinton Howry. Um, I love to connect with everyone. Um, you can shoot me questions. You know, I'm always chatting and that stuff. But yeah, thank you so much, Danielle, for having me. You know, I love to run my mouth and talk. Hope I didn't um, over talk. <laughs> no, not at all. Andrika, anything else? Anything I, I missed? No, I think you got it covered this time. <laughs> yes well thank you I'm, I'm getting better i'm like i'm like the conference i'm like the website <laughs> the app yes and and also if you need any career services like if you need your resume review do not wait to get your resume review do not wait to have an interview prep don't wait till you have an interview to schedule your interview prep so schedule it now practice makes perfect uh it's really needed in the industry and very necessary in order to further your skills so thank you again, everyone. Thank you again, Angel and Clinical Lead. Thank you, Dr. Lovey. Thank you, Latoya. Thank you, Andrika. Thank you, everyone. So connect with us on LinkedIn. You have a great night. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the speakers, myself, Andrika. We are here for you. So good night. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll leave, the chat, I'll leave the chat up in case anyone needs to connect with anyone on LinkedIn. Thank you so much.